All right, so testosterone is a hot topic right now. I'm seeing all kinds of videos about testosterone and women and who should take it and who shouldn't take it. And rightfully so, because it's been ignored for a long time. And it has the potential to increase libido, improve lean mass, and improve bone health. So who doesn't want those things? But the thing is, is that women don't necessarily need testosterone. In fact, anybody who says that all women need testosterone is missing the fact that women can make testosterone on their own after menopause. And testosterone is getting harder to get, especially if you're relying on telehealth providers. So remember that women don't always need it. Other things might be able to be used instead that are less expensive, have less risk associated with them, have lower side effects. So stick around. We're going to talk about this one simple hack that may be all you need instead of testosterone. All right, so the over-the-counter product I'm talking about is DHEA, dihydroepiandrosterone. DHEA is relatively easy to get, at least in the United States. It's not over-the-counter in every country, which could give you some indication as to the potential potency of this over-the-counter product. But we're going to go through some studies that include the impact of DHEA on testosterone, on BMI, on bone mineral density, the dosing that they're using in these studies. But the biggest takeaway here that I want you to get is that women have the capacity to make testosterone naturally after menopause. They might just be missing the precursors of the testosterone that they make naturally, and they just simply need those precursors rather than replacing testosterone. So let me remind you of the physiology here. So when we think of testosterone, most, most people are thinking men, right? And in men, 95% of their testosterone is made in their testicles. So brain tells the testicles, make testosterone, it makes testosterone, and goes throughout the body. That's how men work. Women though, have the potential to make testosterone in their ovaries, as well as in their adrenal glands and elsewhere throughout the body with products made from the adrenal glands, specifically DHEA. So when we look at adrenal function, which is going to be negatively impacted by stress, when we look at adrenal function, we can look at DHEA levels and we can look at cortisol levels. And cortisol is your primary stress hormone. And when cortisol levels are high, DHEA levels are often low. And so what we find is that women who aren't doing a good job of navigating their stress or just overloaded with things, which is really common, we find that DHEA levels are really low. So is testosterone, so is free testosterone, so is IGF-1 for that matter, another good biomarker here. Cortisol levels are high, and we see this really frequently in people with osteoporosis. And this is the picture of anabolic resistance, meaning your body just can't get into an anabolic state because you don't have the androgens to do it. And so our primary goal when we're working with our patients from a lifestyle perspective is to say, hey, can we have an impact here on the adrenal glands so that we can then improve the precursors naturally and potentially supplement them as well, and then not have to go down the pathway of testosterone replacement. So this is something that we've been doing in our practice and it works well for some women. Now we started this way because not everybody wanted to be on testosterone or they didn't tolerate the side effects of testosterone. And so this is an option that allows us some different ways to get to the same endpoint, which is to have enough of an anabolic drive to improve muscle and bone. And it turns out improves other stuff too. All right, so let's look at the science. So so what they were able to pull out of these studies is that there was a significant increase in testosterone levels on average. So the weighted mean difference was a little over 17 nanograms per deciliter, which depending on your starting point for a woman, if you're around you know, 20, 30, or 40, and that bumps you to 50, 60, or 70, that's pretty good, right? So depending on your current levels, adding 17 or 20 nanogram per deciliter to you know, a 20, 30, or 40 starting point is pretty good. So this could actually make a difference in your free testosterone and make a difference in how you feel from an androgen's perspective. Now, it also showed a difference in BMI with a subtle decrease in BMI. Now, we all know BMI is not a great biomarker, but the goal here is that we're, we're hoping that we would improve lean muscle mass and reduce fat mass. Some of these studies went into that, but overall, they didn't say that in the meta-analysis. And then their conclusion from the study was, yes, DHEA could be used to improve testosterone and reduce BMI in elderly women. So in this anabolic population of elderly women, you are going to potentially see some benefit from DHEA. So that's cool. All right, so study number two. So this study is called a dose response meta-analysis of DHEA supplementation on testosterone levels. So what did they do? Well, they actually looked at 42 different publications 
55 study arms. This is a 2020 meta-analysis. So what they found here is that there was an average increase in testosterone, again, looking at testosterone, an average increase in testosterone of 28 nanogram per deciliter. And there was a significant increase across every subgroup. So it didn't really actually matter the dose. Now, dose does matter. We'll talk about that. But everybody saw improvement in testosterone, which is awesome. Now, another thing that was important to point out here is that the impact was greater for women than it was for men. And this isn't surprising, actually, because women are going to have better machinery to use DHEA to make testosterone because, again, men make most of their testosterone in their testicles. So women are going to leverage the DHEA route through the adrenal glands better than would men. So when you break apart the genders, the average in women was almost 31 nanogram per deciliter, and in men it was 21.36. So then what about dose? Well, it turns out that higher doses are gonna lead to more significant increase. I don't know that it was linear. They didn't draw it out like that. So 50 milligrams per day seems to be the threshold at which you see a remarkably different outcome when it comes to testosterone. So the weighted mean difference here over 50 milligrams per day was actually moving up testosterone 58 nanogram per deciliter versus less than 50 milligram per day was around 20 nanogram per deciliter. So that's a big difference in 50 milligrams again was that threshold. So the last thing to talk about here is that age also mattered, unfortunately. In this study, they showed that those under the age of 60 had a bigger impact than those over the age of 60. Does it mean that we don't take it if we're over the age of 60? No, we just know that we become less anabolic. Again, this term anabolic resistant keeps coming up. We get more and more anabolic resistant as we get older. So I would expect to see that the precursor DHEA is not gonna have as much of an anabolic impact as we age. All right, before I get to the rest of the research here, let me just take a quick pause and say that if you haven't been to our masterclass, please consider doing that. We have a bone health masterclass that if you are trying to figure out how to improve your bone health and you're doing it on your own and you have questions, it is a great starting point. So please consider signing up for that. Link is in the description on YouTube, or you can go to our website at optimalhumanhealth.com. So I've got three more studies here and, and we'll, we'll link to these down below and I'm not gonna go through each one because they essentially all show the same thing. So one was more specific to sleep quality, one was specific to, to cognitive function and they, they, they built the studies to look at those as outcomes. But what I'm more interested in, what was the impact on the hormone levels? And then, yeah, did it have any impact on those things? And the answer is DHEA, if it improved testosterone, did improve sleep. DHEA did not seem to have any impact on cognitive function, which isn't surprising because cognitive function takes a long time to change. But what we see consistently in these studies is that DHEA supplementation, especially as we get to doses around 50 milligrams, DHEA is going to have an increase in testosterone. It could potentially increase in estrogen. And if your goal is to increase those sex hormones without replacing them, this could potentially be an effective tool. But like anything, there is a downside. So I mentioned earlier some of the side effects of testosterone that, that women especially don't tolerate. Some men don't tolerate it as well. So let's just run through these. So testosterone is the is one of like the end points of the androgen pathway. So testosterone and dihydrotestosterone will have an impact on cells. When that happens, there is variable breakdown of one to the other, testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, and also the body's gonna respond differently. And that's why measuring testosterone levels, in my opinion, is really important because we wanna know what levels someone is seeing what symptoms. It's hard to say though that this level will result in this symptom. We don't see that in the literature on testosterone, especially in women. But what we do see is that there are some specific side effects of all androgens. So let me review these, testosterone, and then we'll talk about DHEA. So with testosterone, what most people worry about and read about is, oh man, testosterone is going to cause me to have acne. It's going to cause me to have oily skin. It's going to cause my hair to fall out, or it's going to cause hair growth on my face. Now, this is particularly poignant in an older population because I see a lot of women in this group that are already struggling with some of these things. So adding something that's going to cause additional hair loss or cause more hair growth on the face, they don't want that. Totally understand that. And I think that's one of the reasons why testosterone isn't as well tolerated in this age group. Um, but we see that in all age groups. Now, there's some other weird things that can occur at higher doses. So for example, the genitalia can actually get enlarged with too much testosterone. A woman's voice can actually get deeper with too much testosterone. So you can go too far with testosterone. This is where I don't like pellet therapy because pellets 
drive levels in general way too high. And then you do see some of these side effects. And there's a lot of women that have reported changes in their voice or even enlarged genitalia, clitoral enlargement with testosterone pellets at high doses. So we definitely want to stay away from that. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't use testosterone. For those that need it, we should definitely use it. But it's getting harder to obtain because it's a controlled substance and the DEA is cracking down. And it comes with side effects that you may just simply be able to avoid. So let's talk about side effects of DHEA. So DHEA then has the potential side effects, which are similar to testosterone of oily skin, acne, hair loss. We don't really see as much hair growth, but we see them come out differently, meaning that in the testosterone group, if we were to see hair loss, typically we would see what's called temporal hair loss. So hair loss that occurs along here. And sometimes that hair doesn't grow back. Another reason why testosterone is can be scary for some women, but it, do, it can grow back. And so that temporal hair loss is going to be more androgen related. But when people complain about hair loss with DHEA, it seems to be more all over the head. Now, that could be because there are other things associated with it. This is the same thing we see in low thyroid, dietary issues, stress, etc. There's a lot of reasons to lose hair, but we see DHEA hair loss seem to fall into that same pattern if it's actually related at all. Oily skin and acne. It's just simply a testosterone androgen DHEA thing. You're going to see it with any potential androgen and somebody who's susceptible to that. So we might just have to adjust dose based off of that. Now we get into a cancer conversation. So one of the reasons why we like DHEA and testosterone is that it increases this thing called IGF-1. IGF-1 stands for insulin-like growth factor. And we know that IGF-1 is like an anabolic switch. So if your body is in a growth mode, if we're putting on muscle, we're building bone, we want IGF-1 to be high. If we want to lose weight, we want IGF-1 to be low. We want to be catabolic. You have to break down fat in order to lose weight if you're going to lose it through fat. So IGF-1 is sort of this, this kind of switch that we see. So we see a lot of people come into our program and their IGF-1 is very low. Being postmenopausal seems like a just chronic catabolic state for most women, meaning that IGF-1 is low, androgen levels are low. You're just slowly breaking things down. It'll take decades, but you're on this breakdown pathway. We want to push that the other direction. We want IGF-1 to go up. And we know reliably that we can do that with testosterone. We can do it with DHEA. But here's the thing. There is a fear in the cancer prevention world that... IGF-1, when elevated, will provoke cancer, that it causes cancer. Now, this is a contentious argument because when you look at the associations of IGF-1 and cancer, it is there. That association exists. But if you look at the things that cause IGF-1 to go up, many of them are going to cause IGF-1 to rise and fall. Others are going to cause them to rise and stay high. I'll give you some examples. So if you were to eat a high protein meal, and if you like go out and eat like a ribeye steak, your IGF-1 will go up. If you only eat the steak, your IGF-1 will come back down. If you eat a ribeye steak and a milkshake and some French fries and chocolate cake for dessert, your IGF-1 will go up and it'll stay up. And we see this from a nutrition perspective where a calorie dense, highly processed food diet will result in chronic elevation of IGF versus a whole foods meal where it rises and falls. Same thing with exercise. IGF-1 will rise and fall with exercise. So I think I would be hard pressed to find anybody that would say that exercise causes cancer. But to say that a calorie dense, highly processed food diet causes cancer? Yeah, probably, right? And so this is where IGF-1 can get really confusing because we don't want our cancers to be in an anabolic mode. We don't want IGF-1 to be chronically elevated, but we want it to rise and fall. And we should also have probably periods of time where we're anabolic and periods of time where we're catabolic. If we were nice and neutral and had no pathologic diseases, we want to be on both sides of that equation about equal amounts. That's how we would stay healthy. But when you have osteoporosis, if you have sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, you need IGF-1 to rise in order to build muscle and bone. So we want to bias towards being more anabolic than catabolic while we're trying to build muscle and bone. If you try to balance them out, you're not going to build muscle and bone because you're going to stay right where you are. We don't want that. Fracture risk is too high. So even though there is this concern of feeding cancer with IGF-1, 
we know that we have the current pathological state of osteoporosis and increased fracture risk. I think we have to decide that we're going to treat the thing that we know rather than the thing that we're afraid of. Treat the devil you know, not the one you fear, because we know that we have this risk of fracture. And that's how I look at it. Now, I don't wish a cancer diagnosis on anybody, but fearing IGF-1 because you're concerned about having cancer someday, I see this as a reason why people fail to improve their bone health. All right, so then let's talk about products. Everybody wants to know, what do I take? Well, the good news is I don't have a product to sell. I got no affiliations with anything that makes DHEA. DHEA is widely available in the US. Every major supplement company makes it. Just make sure that it's micronized. From a dosing perspective, we're starting most women around 10 milligrams. And this is a really interesting area because some women do great on 25 milligrams. Like I said, the literature supports using 50 milligrams. The literature for men supports using 100 milligrams. Big doses result in more side effects. So for us, we start small, we go slow, we build it up slowly, and then we watch for side effects, particularly hair loss with DHEA. But as I mentioned in the literature, we can see significant increases. In fact, I didn't show you these numbers, but one of the studies showed that you can get 180% increase in testosterone on average with DHEA supplementation. So we really can see a difference, especially in women, and it might help us to avoid some of the potential risks of testosterone. So that's it. I hope you found that helpful. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.